That's great. I'm going to stand up too. It's tricky being a post-lunch speaker. I'm getting a little too comfortable sitting over there. Standing up will keep me going. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors as well for inviting me to participate in this. I think this is a great event. It's not the first event I've participated in like this at MAI, and each one is better than the one before. I think the current leadership is doing an outstanding job of bringing uh, important issues to the table in a, 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 uh, an a appealing and, and um, I think, productive uh, public way. Uh, and I'd like to invite all of you to join me in a round of applause for Kevin and Suzanne and everyone else. We put this together. So thank you. So when you're, you know, you're a late speaker, you're always looking at your predecessors and looking for things that you can pull from them. And so that's part of my introduction. The other uh, is to say that I go to a lot of Indian law conferences. I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm a legal historian, but I'm mostly a law professor. And, uh, and I always come away from them with mixed feelings. And Kevin sort of alluded to this earlier. You come away feeling uh, a bit hopeful, you know, optimistic as you've been with your, your friends and their projects and that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm always, I always come away troubled by something. And it's always something I haven't been expected to be troubled by. Um, and this one was really unexpected. So what my, I'm gonna c carry away from this and be troubled by uh, is an image that Suzanne left me with uh, after the conversation um, uh, just uh, uh, before uh, our, our panel, which was uh, a picture that I'm gonna have to carry home and process of George Washington smiling. And I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, you know, I'm a believer in confronting problematic images. So I was sitting here um, while my colleagues were speaking and thinking, well, how am I gonna process this? And then it occurred to me that um, the, the more interesting question was, why is it so troubling, this picture of George Washington with a full-faced grin? And, and I realized that, um, that that's actually related to what I wanna talk about. So that's my other introductory um, segue. Um, and, and that's this, this, this thing that happens with state building, uh, and it happens in every country. Um, it's happening in Scotland today. It has been for the last few months. It's happened in the United States over the last couple centuries of taking the, the founders of the Republic, who were really, like in our case, the, the bad guys of the British Empire, the troublemakers of the British Empire, all of whom should probably been, uh, have been imprisoned and excoriated, uh, and turning them into sanctified beings and statues and monuments and this sort of thing. And then we're discouraged uh, from, from looking too closely at them. Um, and when we do uh, decide to look closely at them, oftentimes I think we go too far. Like poor Thomas Jefferson, bless his heart, I'm an alum of the University of Virginia where he's still sanctified for the most part, but if he's not sanctified, he's ripped to shreds. <laughs> and there's very little understanding in the middle or any sort of, well, yeah, there's problems and this sort of thing. You sort of go one extreme. And I think that's maybe part of the nature of academic discourse and there's something healthy in it. Um, having said that, um, the person that I want to spend a few minutes talking about today is uh, John Marshall, who I think has been subject to the same sort of sanctification, uh, especially in the legal academy. And my colleagues who are law professors, Kevin's not here, but Bob will agree with me, I think, and Matthew, um, that Marshall is sort of the great untouchable in a sense. We, we read his opinions, we take notes on his opinions, um, yeah, he's a political operator and we get that, but it doesn't matter because he's John Marshall. Um, we never look too closely at his personal life, which was fairly um, um, interesting, I guess I should say. Um, his marriage was unusual. <laughs> there are all sorts of things that one could say but one doesn't say about John Marshall. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that. Some of you are too excited, really. <laughs> John Marshall's marriage, how's that about treaties? <laughs> well, it's not, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, of course, we do have a book signing later. If you buy the book, I'm happy to share what I know. <laughs> now, so, um, so what about John Marshall? Well, Bob talked earlier about the, the discovery doctrine. Um, and so here's the, the outline of what I'm going to talk about. John Marshall is the author of an opinion, 1823 opinion, called Johnson versus McIntosh. Johnson versus McIntosh is the first of three John Marshall authored opinions. Uh, that deal with n native rights. The first is Johnson, the second is uh, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia from 1831, and the last is the 1832 opinion, Worcester versus Georgia. And all of you probably heard of all of these, and you, have, you may have read them and you have some sense. Uh, Johnson versus McIntosh deals with native real property rights. 
Uh, and then the uh, Worcester, our Cherokee Nation versus Georgia gives us that guardian ward language and domestic dependent nation language. And then Worcester versus Georgia is the decision that says that the state of Georgia cannot impose its laws on the Cherokee Nation, um, but it's ignored and we have Indian removal and that sort of thing. That's sort of the conventional story that we get. Marshall um, plays a role, uh, a somewhat confused role in this story. He's the author of the Discovery Doctrine, which as Bob mentioned earlier is not universally liked <laughs> and maybe universally disliked, at least among folks who do, uh, who do Indian law stuff or who are advocates for indigenous peoples, not just in the US, but throughout the English speaking world because we've exported it. And I may talk a bit about that a bit about le that later, and Brenda suggested that earlier when she mentioned Canada, but Australia, New Zealand, and other places as well have adopted John Marshall's formulation uh, of the Discovery Doctrine from Johnson, um, from Johnson versus McIntosh. Um, uh, so, uh, so there are those three decisions, um, uh, and Marshall's role, uh, we know, was as the author of the Discovery Doctrine, but then later when we get to the Cherokee removal cases, he shows up on the record to the extent he shows up as all as, a, as an opponent of Indian removal and his decision in Worcester is heroic. Uh, and he, uh, because he um, uh, says that Georgia can't impose its laws on the Cherokee, tries to stop the removal process. Um, and then generations of law professors have said, okay, well, so how is the guy who wrote the Discovery Doctrine, and we'll talk in a minute about what it is, how can he be the same guy who wrote Worcester versus Georgia, and how do we reconcile the law that's contained uh, in those doctrines? And there's an enormous amount of very interesting legal scholarship, legal historical scholarship, in which folks take the Worcester versus Georgian, Georgia hard line against state imposition of law and try and make it consistent with the discovery doctrine in Johnson versus McIntosh. Um, I started working on this book on the Johnson case when I was a history grad student uh, years ago, 1990, uh, and um, ended up getting so wrapped up in the complexities of this uh, that I gave 14 years of my life to this project. And I was doing other stuff too, I was eating and stuff, but, um, and I had a job. But, but, but my academic uh, energy was going into trying to figure out um, how to, how to reconcile these, and I ended up uncovering all sorts of um, wonderful old lost documents and things like that, uh, and that's why the project became so big. And so I wanna give you in a nutshell right now, and it's, you get, you'll get it in the chapter in the book, which I encourage you to buy. Um, and if you're really into this, I have another book on it that's just on this, called Conquest by Law, Oxford University Press, and my publicist would say, buy that too. Um, the, um, so what I want to try and give you, though, in, in like the next 12 minutes is, is the overview of the story, and I think it's the right story. I think it's the way to look at these cases, and I think that, that in order to, to see it, the, the, the evolution of John Marshall's thinking and the meaning of the Discovery Doctrine, what, what I believe to be the real meaning of these, of these Marshall Trilogy cases, you have to be prepared to smash the statue of John Marshall. You have to be prepared to say he wasn't God, uh, nor was he the devil. He was just a guy who wore pants, had a strange wife, and went to work every day, and sometimes screwed up. And so that is my bottom line on the Discovery Doctrine. Um, this is a spoiler, so cover your ears. I think, he's, I think he made it up. <laughs> I think he regretted it almost immediately. I think he did his best to bury it, but he just couldn't pull it off. And part of the reason is Andrew Jackson and part of the reason is Marshall was an old guy by that time. So, and he didn't live to pull it off. So, here's the story in short. The, the discovery doctrine, Johnson versus McIntosh is a lawsuit uh, brought by a, a land, couple land speculation companies. Um, they claim to have bought, uh, they did, uh, buy land during the late colonial era. So this is 1773 and 1775 from a bunch of Indians in what will become the states of Indiana and Illinois, Peoria and Piankishaw and others. And uh, they, they did so in violation of British law. Uh, the British king, uh, George III, had issued a proclamation in October 1763 that said, nobody but me gets to buy land west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and, and these guys didn't have permission to, and they tried to get away with it, but it was illegal, and everybody knew that it was illegal, assuming that the proclamation of 1763 was valid under the British Constitution. These guys spent decades trying to get somebody to recognize their claim to title, and eventually, 
uh, after the American Revolution, after the new constitution, a new federal government comes in, the US sent treaty negotiators out there and they bought the same land from the same Indians who got to sell it twice. So they did okay, I guess. But that left this, these land company speculators in the lurch because now it wasn't just the Indians they were claiming title against, it was the United States and then the United States started to sell its land and this land, and so then they had individual landowners who were claiming title under the United States, and they were claiming title by a direct Indian purchase that was illegal under British law, but theirs was first, right? So they end up postponing bringing legal action for the reason that they, there was no court that had territorial jurisdiction over the lands from which they could have appealed to the Supreme Court until Illinois and Indiana became states, then they got regular federal courts, and then they sent lawyers out. They found a guy, a great guy who's deserving of more time than I have, called William McIntosh, uh, to stand in as a collusive defendant. McIntosh signed a stipulation of fact, agreeing to anything they wanted him to agree to, because he hated the people who were going to be dispossessed by this uh, lawsuit. Uh, and the only issue they left open for argument was the question, was the proclamation of 1763 constitutional under the British Constitution? And the lawyers for the land speculators figured this is a dead winner. This is the 1820s by this time. Supreme Court's filled with uh, Revolutionary War veterans and, and, and all of these guys had fought the revolution in part based on their belief that the proclamation of 1763, which said you guys can't buy Indian lands, was unconstitutional under the British Constitution. So surely they're gonna win on this. And they take the case to the Supreme Court and they lose. Now, here's where the case becomes weird. They lose, in part, on the ground that Marshall and his colleagues find that the Proclamation of 1763 was constitutional under the British Constitution. And that's there. So they lost and they're disappointed. That takes about one paragraph in an opinion that's more than 20 pages long. Now, you think, well, why is the rest of this stuff here? And what is it? And so you start reading it, and it's the discovery doctrine. And what the discovery doctrine says, according to Marshall in Johnson versus McIntosh, is there's another reason that this title of this land speculation concern is invalid, and that's that upon discovery of the new world, the discovering European sovereign, in this case the English, automatically acquired ownership of the underlying title to all discovered lands. So they own it automatically the native peoples retain an occupancy right to those lands, a right to occupy them. And that right to occupy them, they can keep as long as they want, um, but once they decide to alienate it, to sell it or give it away, they can only do so to the same discovering sovereign. That's the Johnson discovery rule. Now, that's still the law in the United States. When we talk about trust lands, that's lands the title to which is owned by the United States, under the Johnson rule, tribe owns an occupancy right, and if they want to sell it, they can sell it, but only to the United States, which means you can't mortgage it, you can't do all sorts of things with it. Now, and that's the rule that we've exported to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. Now, two questions occur. Um, one is, uh, where did this come from? And the other is, why is it here? So both of these are distressing, all right? So sort of brace yourselves. Well, they are to me. Maybe they won't be to you. Maybe you're more jaded than I. The where it comes from question, um, if you read the opinion, what you'll see is that there are no citations in, to anything in the section justifying the adoption of this as the court's understanding of the consequences of European discovery, at least in that portion of the opinion that uh, relates the English rule. Um, that section of the opinion, it's really long, um, but it's uh, basically a history of English colonization drawing on the terms of various charters which purport to, in Marshall's read, grant title to the land. And then these, these excerpts uh, from various charters are joined by conjunctive sentences that say, Things like, um, you know, it's, it's clear that Britain, uh, England assumed that they owned, or understood that they owned title to the land. Um, just read the following charter, and you do, and then the next uh, conjunctive passage will say, see, <laughs> everybody knew that England owned, but there's no citation in there either. 
So there's a bit of creation here. Now, let me say a word, um, by the way, about John Marshall. I've read, and you should do this with liquor, um, a, every Marshall opinion in chronological order. And uh, it, it takes a long time, but it's actually kind of fun. Well, for some of you, it would be. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Matthew, yes. <laughs> and, and what you'll find is that there are certain stylistic gimmicks that Marshall uses. And I think this is part of the reason we haven't figured this out yet. And here's one, there are loads, we could have a long talk about this, but the one that matters is virtually every time, I realized uh, about three quarters of the way through, virtually every time that Marshall um, is about to make something up or, or introduce, let me say this charitably, a questionable proposition, he will introduce that questionable proposition with some variation of the following. It is beyond dispute that, and then the, <laughs> as everyone has always known, and then the questionable proposition. No one could argue against the proposition that, and then. Now, this, it's, it's, this was a common device in, in debate, and they're all classically trained, these jurists in the early Republican period. They know all of these conventions of, of debate. It's just that we don't. So we read these opinions 200 years later, and we don't get that he's lying, right? In the, in the way that his contemporaries did. We just assume, and mind, we're back with the statue, if John Marshall said it's beyond dispute that, then it must be true. And that, I think, is how we've understood the discovery doctrine. By the way, Thomas Jefferson got this. I love Thomas Jefferson, sort of, right? But I'm a Virginian. So, um, and I want to read uh, quickly his commentary on Marshall's practice. This is a letter he wrote to his Supreme Court appointee, William Johnson, uh, about uh, just a matter of weeks after, this is June 1823, and the Johnson decision was handed down at the end of February, so it's just a few months later. Um, talking about Johnson, I mean, uh, Marshall's method of drafting opinions, he said, um, and, and he's alluding here to this, the circumstance, uh, circumstances like the circumstance I, I alluded to in Johnson where he's answered the question, so why is the other 20 pages of discovery doctrine there? And here's what Jefferson says. He says this practice of Judge Justice Marshall of traveling out of his case to prescribe what the law would be in a moot case not before the court is very irregular and very censurable. And, and here's why, he said. These are the reasons he identified, and I'm going to add another to it. He said, um, use for example, the constitutional discussion in Marbury versus Madison, he said, um, which is merely an obiter dissertation of the Chief Justice, which is to say, we lawyers say obiter dicta means stuff the justices want to talk about, and it may be persuasive in future cases, but it's not binding, it's not precedential. So he says this constitutional discussion is merely an obiter dissertation of the Chief Justice, yet, and this is the important point, continually cited by bench and bar as if it were settled law. That's the discovery doctrine, in my judgment. Now. So, so why is it there? That's a story I don't have time for, but I, I really, so you gotta read the book, <laughs> the first book, <laughs> right? If you're interested in this. But the answer is, uh, this is the argument I make in the book, and I'm satisfied, I spent 14 years on this. It was to resolve a contemporaneous dispute between the state of Kentucky and the state of Virginia over who owned title to militia lands, lands granted to Virginia Revolutionary War soldiers as compensation for their service to the state of Virginia during the American Revolution. What had happened was the, the governor of Virginia had granted title to these lands to these vets at the end of the war, but the Chickasaws were there. They were Chickasaw lands. And what Marshall had to do, and they were, so they were fighting after Kentucky became an independent state and the Chickasaws left, they're fighting over who owns them. What Marshall's job, self-appointed job in Johnson versus McIntosh was, after getting rid of these speculators, was to say, now how can I solve the problem of these militia veterans? Um, because I've got a, the governor of Virginia has to have had a real property interest, has to have owned something that he could have given to them, right? Not just some speculative one day I may buy this. He has to have owned something. But on the other hand, the Chickasaws had to have had a legal basis for being there all these years. And that problem is solved by this formulation of the discovery doctrine, right? That Virginia inherited the English claim, so Virginia owns the underlying title at the time of the revolution to the Chickasaw's lands. That's what it gave the militia veterans. Chickasaws retain their occupancy right. Once they left, the Virginia militia veterans could go in. And I think that's all Marshall ever intended to do with the discovery doctrine 
as formulated in Johnson versus McIntosh, because that was one of those freakish accidents where a state had granted Indian lands before the Indian lands were purchased. The federal government had decided we're not doing that again. The federal government's going to buy Indian lands. This is the Trade and Intercourse Act, and it's been the policy since the Northwest Ordinance way back during the Revolution. So the federal government's going to buy them, and then we're going to sell them. This is an accident that will not recur. No one will ever remember this decision or this doctrine <laughs> ever again. Now, this is where he screwed up. And the, the thing that I would add to Jefferson's list of problems with traveling out, out of a case presented is that when you don't give lawyers and parties the opportunity to make argument, you're flying blind. So if he had asked the lawyers, well, what do you think if I add a discovery doctrine section to this Johnson versus McIntosh? They would have had an opportunity to say, don't do that because guess what's going to happen? Because people could have anticipated what actually did happen those people just didn't include John Marshall, who got blindsided by this. Because what happened was, the state of Georgia, where the Cherokees dwelt, right, at, at, in the early 1820s, had been trying to get rid of the Cherokees since 1802, when they ceded Alabama, their claims to Alabama and Mississippi to the U.S. government. And the U.S. had promised, we'll enter into a treaty, the Cherokees weren't interested, sort of like Kevin talked about the Navajo, nah, I think we're gonna stay here. Georgia, somebody in the Georgia government around in the mid-1820s discovered Johnson versus McIntosh. And Johnson versus McIntosh, the discovery doctrine section says that the discovering sovereign acquires underlying title to discovered lands. Well, that would have been England for the Cherokee lands. Georgia individually declared independence from England, so Georgia would have inherited that ownership. And Georgia at no time had ceded that to the United States. That means Georgia still owns the underlying title of the Cherokee lands. Now, if you own property that somebody else lives in and has a legal right to live in, what's that? You're their landlord. And they actually use these words in the debate. Georgia's the landlord for the Cherokee nation. So how do you get rid of tenants that you don't like? Well, you change the lease terms, right? It's a lovely little dog, but I'm afraid new no pets policy. You can stay. <laughs> But you got to, you know, kill the dog or something. And so Georgia's version of this was to say to the Cherokee Nation, you guys can stay. This is legislation 1827 or 28. You can stay, but from now on, you're going to be subject to Georgia law. And Tennessee says, you can do that? Okay. And so Tennessee passes the same statute. Alabama passes the same statute. And this is the incentive to remove. Now, none of these tribes wants to be subject to state law. The Cherokees go to court twice to stop it to the Supreme Court. Cherokee Nation versus Georgia is dismissed because the court doesn't have jurisdiction, they say, because the Cherokees aren't a foreign state for purposes of Article III original jurisdiction for you lawyers out there. And so Worcester versus Georgia comes, and that's where John Marshall has a chance to clean up the mess he made. And he knows he made this mess. He knows that Johnson versus McIntosh is the authority. It's cited by the pro-removal people. It's cited by the Georgia Supreme Court in an earlier, which is a convention of Georgia judges, in an earlier capital case uh, involving a guy called Corn Tassel who's sentenced to death and executed in defiance of an order from the Supreme Court of the United States uh, to send the file up because they want to take a look at it. Marshall's got to go in and he's got to stop removal. And to stop removal, he's got to get rid of the Johnson versus McIntosh formulation of the discovery doctrine. And he does. There are two parts to the Worcester decision. One is the one we teach, which is that Georgia can't impose its laws because to do so is inconsistent with federal treaties and statutes. That's the supremacy clause of the Constitution. And that's there. And that's interesting. But the last the, and more important to that reason is the more subtle reason, which is Georgia can't do it because Georgia doesn't own the fee title to their land. He doesn't come out and expressly overrule the Johnson formulation of the discovery doctrine. He's never overruled an earlier Supreme Court decision. That's part of Marshall's deal. Marshall always upholds himself because of institutional insecurity. So what he does instead is to rewrite it, and I encourage you to reread the Worcester opinion. If you read the chapter, I've got the sections in there. He rewrites the history, the British history. He uh, says, uh, in conclusion, something radically different. He says, what did the British claim? They claimed the exclusive right to purchase such lands as the natives were willing to sell, period. And then in case you missed it, he said, they did not claim any more, nor was it ever so understood, period. It isn't possible to reconcile that with Johnson, except 
as an overruling of the Johnson decision, in my judgment. And the question is, what happened after that? Um, and what happened was demography. And be, in the interest of time, and we can talk about this, and I can give you more detail if you're interested in the question and answer period. What happened was uh, Marshall died, his colleagues died, John, Andrew Jackson, uh, as the president got to appoint their replacements, and within a very short period of time, a majority of the justices were Jacksonians, who took the opportunity in six separate opinions issued between 1835 and 1842 to reintroduce that vesting of fee title material from the Johnson decision gratuitously into opinions. The first of these was introduced by a guy called Henry Baldwin, who was certifiably insane. And so what I want to say to you, uh, and I'll close with this, um, though somebody asked me where the rule came from, because uh, I didn't want to talk about that, but I won't take the time. If you cite that opinion today, if you cite the Johnson versus McIntosh opinion, or cite the formulation of the discovery doctrine that vests ownership of indigenous lands in the discovering European sovereign, I'm going to encourage you, or if somebody cites it to you, I want you to say that's not John Marshall's discovery doctrine. It was a mistake for Marshall, and he got rid of it within 10 years. It's Henry Baldwin's discovery doctrine Baldwin was an Andrew Jackson appointee and certifiably insane. And with any luck, eventually enough courts will hear that message and we can revisit this doctrine, which as um, Professor Ridingen said, and I think Bob mentioned earlier, is clearly racist, it's Christian imperialism, but it's also, and in the spirit of this panel, bad acts, bad paper, I just add, it's bad law. So thank you very much.